Welcome to Founder Stories. I'm Mike Abbott. With me today, I have Mikhail Svana from Zendesk. Welcome. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about Zendesk. Yeah, so uh, Zendesk, we are a software company. We produce a customer service platform that have been used by great companies all around the world. More than 30,000 businesses are using uh, centers to provide great customer service, great customer care to more than uh, 200 million end users out there. Great, and when did you start the company? So the company is five years old. We launched the product uh, October 2007 in Denmark, Copenhagen, thus the funny accent, um, and bootstrapped it out of Copenhagen a few years before we, we moved over here. Mm -hmm. Now, moving a company from a different country to here, like, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, was, was it your choice, and did people that were part of that original company stay in Copenhagen, or how, how did that work out? Yeah, so, so we, we were a very uh, virtual bootstrap company. So in many ways, it was just the three founders. We had some different people helping us on and off. And uh, once we decided to move to San Francisco, we tried to get everybody to move here, relocate everybody. So we had the core team here. But until then, it was all uh, virtual. Um, I think we, uh, we started to pitch US investors, American investors in 2008, which was a great time to pitch <laughs> investors. But we were very successful in, in landing our, uh, our early investors and very, very lucky and fortunate in all of that. Um, and of course, US investors, they want their, they want their uh, portfolio companies close to them, which is understandable. And I think we also, we had the TechCrunch dream, the TechCrunch bug, you know. Uh, there was no doubt that we wanted to get over here and try it out and, and live the dream in many ways. So you moved the company over yeah. and then you fast forward about six years and the company's 400 people and you've got offices across the U.S. and across the world. Yep. Now, one of your offices I find interesting, you have an office in Madison, Wisconsin. Yes, yes. So, like, tell us, like, why did you put an office there and, and, and how has that worked out for the company? No, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a funny story. Um, I think I, I, I ask people all the time, how did we actually end up with an office in Madison? And I think I hear a, a different story each time. But I think it was something about a couple of guys that we hired that uh, was supposed to relocate to San Francisco. That didn't happen. But we found out they were really great guys. Uh, so we hired them where they were in Madison. Um, and because they turned out to be really great and because they had a big network to hire from, we just started to adding more and more people. And I think we have like 12, 14 people there now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, now we looked at all the demographics of the area. We looked at the schools, the university, of course, uh, the recruiting platform in general. And uh, I went up there a few weeks ago. And it's a great place. So now we decided to set up an actual hub there. Um, and scale it to like 100 people initially. Wow. Yeah, because I, mean, I don't know of too many companies that are kind of tapping the talent uh, that are coming out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It's um, interesting. Yeah, uh, that's a, so I think there's a lot of, it seems like there's a lot of great people coming out yeah. of that university. So then the next logical question is you got, I mean, you, have, you will have a team of 100. Yeah. You've got 270 people here. So you've got roughly yeah. 130, you know, Madison, in the in the era, Europe, yep. Asia. Yep. How what have you found to work on the communication side, and what things have you tried that just didn't work, <laughs> on, on keeping everyone on the same page with what you're doing? Um, I think that if you when you build a company today, there's a lot of tools to keep you really well connected, even though you're very disconnected physically. Um, so one of the things that I keep coming back to that I think is really really important for the company is that we use Yammer. Uh, so that was our good neighbors when we lived in this building. Uh, they had just moved in as we moved in, and we grew up in the same pace and everything. And we had like relatives that worked together across the companies and so on. It's a very fun phase when we were in this building. Um, but we've always been using Yammer since the very, very early days to keep everybody on the same page. So I, we don't police our Yammer. I ask people to share whatever they think is necessary to share. Uh, share their successes, share their failures, share their troubles, share their funny stories, share their movie preference, whatever. Just get everybody a feeling for each other around that virtual kind of meeting place that Yammer has become for us. So I think that's not, of course, not the only thing. We do a lot with training. We get every employee's Every employee, new employee comes to San Francisco and spend a few weeks with us. We do training. They come on a regular basis every year at least. We have 
uh, people from the San Francisco office visiting our local offices. We have people coming in on visas and so on. So we try to be, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, we try to be, uh, we try to keep this culture of exchanging a lot and traveling a lot and and really getting to know each other as people. I think getting the individual people to know each other is the kind of the platform for building good kind of structures that can scale globally. So as you as you've gone from zero to four hundred, I'm kind of curious. When did you roll out Yammer and and what were some of the kind of insights that you learned as, as being a CEO? Because you had been a CEO before, but the company was much smaller. Much, much smaller, 35 people. So tell us a little bit about like zero to 50. Like what were the tools you used? What did you kind of find that worked or didn't work? And then what did you have to kind of add or remove as you went to 100? <laughs> oh, there's so many lessons. And, and I don't know, like, uh, I, think, I think key is that you really and and that's where it's that's where you that's where it's that's where Silicon Valley and San Francisco is so important. You really need to build a great team around you. Um, you really need to build uh, leadership and uh, communication in the leadership so you can scale that process. So getting good people in that can that can also scale their individual organizations and having kind of a team of CEOs that can you know, scale the company and can work together as a group. I think that's I think that's the most important thing in scaling a company and make sure that, you know, the leadership team all has shared values about how we want to do this and, 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 and have a leadership team that can sit around the table or sit around the dinner table even and work together and understand each other and where each other comes from and the the, the issues and the troubles each of us have in our roles. Um, uh, so that we can scale the company, um, but I've I've had to learn it all. I, I had no, I knew nothing when I moved yeah. here, and um, so I've 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 had great uh, help from my board. I have a great board, and we have a great board dynamic, which has been you know super super important for me. And they there's also a culture in Silicon Valley in San Francisco that you don't meet anywhere else, where you can get you, you I can go out and visit other CEOs and other founders, and they take the time with me, and that has been a big experience for me in my early days that they all take that time with me and t tell me their story. And of course I can't use their experiences for anything. That's like kids, you know. They, yeah. you, I have to go out and get burned myself. But it just, it, <laughs> it just, it just builds a much more uh, coherent story. I was talking to someone recently about the exact topic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that I know when I was starting Composite, I was always impressed by the willingness of people yeah. to make time. Yeah. To help when there's really no reason to, and I think that kind of pay it forward culture yeah. Yeah. is really what makes this place very unique. Yeah, I totally agree, and I, I really try to subscribe to that, and and yeah. and also uh, when I get uh, when people want to spend time with me, I really try to make sure I can do that because it's it's just a great, I think it fuels the growth a lot here in the in the region. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one of the other kind of shifts that that your companies latch onto, which I think is interesting, is, is a shift around the customer. Yeah. Um, Talk to me a little bit about that and where that where do you kind of see that going? Yeah, no, because th that's of course very interesting. Um, our background was that we were a couple of uh, of of, uh, of us founders were in the industry for a few years and were kind of devastated with the the, the quality and the state of kind of that products in that industry. So that made us sit down and say, like, let's just build a bigger product, a better product. And we got, we got a third founder who came to, to it from a kind of a completely different perspective. And that was very helpful for us in not, not building a product for the industry, but a product for everybody. Um, that said, we were 100% product focused. Didn't think about the market at all. <laughs> Best business plan ever. I think our business plan was all about just make the customers happy. <laughs> um, Very succinct. <laughs> <laughs> Do that and you win. <laughs> um, so, so I think what have then what have happened over the last five or six years is that the notion of customer service has changed from just being this car center to something where you can create real, meaningful, long-term relationships with your customers and, and think about it as a revenue center. So um, I, think, um, I think we all realize how easy it is for us to influence our, you know, our friends, our neighbors, our family about products to buy or products not to buy. We have become the primary marketing channel <laughs> for companies. We really influence, and we can see that just in our business. I think almost 75% of our customers come to us through recommendation, 
it's, <laughs> a, it's a mind-blowing number. Um, and I think we, we, our product has become a facilitator for other companies in thinking about their business that way. Really make their customers happy and they will recommend that to other customers um, and they will buy their product. If that's, of course, of course, also the flip side, you know, it's, it's really easy for us to vent our frustrations about a company and companies today, they need an ability to embrace that and, and kind of make sure that they are listening. Um, kind of switching back to you and your CEO role, I mean, as, as the company has gone to 400, have you started to apply something like OKRs or, or an approach like that to just get, give you visibility to like how your company is doing? Or is it much simpler, like looking at happy customers, product shipping, awesome? <laughs> I, I don't know what OKRs are. Yeah, which is, it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's actually never the, actually is originated at Intel, but it's objectives and key results. And, and Google's a, a big advocate of that. Okay. Um, so, we have, of course, we have a lot of different key metrics in our organization and KPIs. I think what we try to become a more and more integral part of our company culture is NPS, Net mm -hmm. Promoter Score. Mm -hmm. uh, and use that as the core. To use, our customers are happy. Yes, That's exactly. the metric that we're going to measure exactly. ourselves on. And I think uh, I listen a lot to Intuit about their usage of NPS, mm -hmm. and I think it's a great, great, uh, it's a great, uh, it's a great, it's a great, indicator to have and, mm -hmm. and to use that to drive your business. And it's, it's amazing, like Intuit is this five and a, four and a half billion dollar revenue software company and we talk so little about them in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And they've done amazing things for, a, for the small medium business market, uh, which is also an industry we are in. Um, and I think we, we, uh, we have a tendency to go full enterprise uh, when we talk in, this, in the Valley and mm -hmm. in San Francisco about our business strategies. And I think they've shown amazingly how you can really scale dramatically mm -hmm. a business for mm -hmm. small business. Let me ask the question a little bit yes. differently. For, for you as a CEO, like, how do you know, what, what are the tools and metrics do you use to understand what part of your company is working well and what parts are maybe not working as well? Um, so, of course, we have, like, all my my different department heads. So I have a CFO, I have a chief creative officer that reports directly to me, I have a chief marketing officer, I have a general counsel, I have a uh, sales leadership, I have our uh, product engineering leadership. And I think they're all using different indicators or different mm -hmm. types they're of... They're kind of their own CEOs. Yeah, they yeah. are. And I think that's, that's the kind of dynamic you want on your leadership team. And of course, we consolidate all this data mm -hmm. to kind of uh, feel out where we are. But the, it is, of course, very different data. And mm -hmm. I haven't made any attempt to kind of consolidate and yeah. kind of or, or, or unify them. Yeah. I just ask, because I mean, as, as companies grow, as you know, at yeah. 400, you, you you get further and further distance from different aspects of the, of the yeah. business and the company, yeah. and it becomes it can, can become a challenge for especially the first time CEOs or yeah to, and to really just understand like what are the right things for me to be doing. And I and as we continue to grow, like we grow a hundred percent at least year over year. Like in the early days, we were like three hundred percent, two hundred percent. Now we're growing at a hundred percent a year rate. And uh, that stuff is just going to be increasingly complicated. And I think like we have a lot of things that we need to learn. But I think having good leadership and team is one of the things that makes it possible for me to you know, believe that we can scale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and spend time with your family. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael, it's been great to have you on no. Founder Stories. Thank you so much. And thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time.